Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. I'm here with Peter Hurley, the headshot king from New York City, founder of the Headshot crew, uh, New York City portrait photographer, and uh, uh, a sailor, uh, U.S. started out and almost made the Olympics with the U.S. sailing team, but he's still got sailing in his blood. If we talk to him in uh, another year, he might be world champion uh, from, from this upcoming uh, competition heading this way. So Peter, I wanted to follow up and ask you about focus and attention to detail you see when you're looking through the lens. Would you expand on that? Sure. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I've found that when you're looking at, I mean, at least when it comes to photography, and I think you can look at this in all aspects of life, when you look, look at like, I'm trying to be the best photographer I can be. I mean, I never point the camera at anybody and like, try any hard less you know than i than i would i mean i'm always trying to take capture a moment an expression a uh get the best light on somebody that kind of thing you know i've and and people really care i mean i've never had anybody you know come in and say uh oh peter we know you're really good but with me you can pull back the throttle a little bit <laughs> like that. nobody wants that they all want to look their best so i think i have to find a way to make them look their best. And I think that the the human face is such an interesting thing. I don't think there's anything more interesting on the planet. And I guess that's why I, I enjoy my job so much. Um, but the way we control it and the way we create expressions and the, and the nuances in each person's face are extremely interesting to me. So I could light somebody perfectly. I could, you know, I've got great equipment and uh, I've got great makeup artists and I can make people look fantastic. But if they're not with me mentally, it's just not there. So a lot of photographers feel that pressing the button's their job, lighting the subject and pressing the button. And I feel like my job starts when I start directing them on what to do with their face. And I think that that kind of detail is, is really what it's about. And it's very, uh, it's not the easiest thing, but it's really what created my career. It's the only, there's only a few things that um, I can pinpoint that help me propel me to where you know, where I got with this. Um, and it's uh, definitely the attention to details one, but it's also, you know, sticking to my guns um, and doing things that kind of outside the box and, and having, you know, in New York, it was really about actors for headshots. And now it's, you know, now I'm doing global stuff and, and doing corporations and you know, shooting CEOs and people flying all over the place. And, and I work with, uh, I train photographers. And now I have a company where I, I give them jobs. We work with companies all over the world um, and stuff like that. So it's not just actors, but when I started, it was just like, I was just photographing actors. So I, I being one, I kind of knew, you know, how to get to them. And I figured out uh, ways to get them. I still try to apply uh, the thing that there's a quote from Albert Einstein that I love. And he, and he said um, he never made one of his discoveries through the process of rational thought. And I was like, okay, how do I think outside the box on this? What's what, how do I turn this thing upside down? Like, what could I possibly do that's different? And, um, and that was that the biggest thing for me was the expression. I did this thing called uh, I called it squinching. And I did this video and I said, it's all about the squinch. And um, what I found was that, cause I, when I was modeling, we were trying to figure, I remember talking to a buddy of mine who was a model. He was a Ralph Lauren model and a Abercrombie Fitch model like me. And, and, um, and we, were on, we were together one time and he said, well, what do you do when you look like, how do you look cooler in the camera? I was like, I don't know, do you squint or something? And I was like, I don't know. Yeah. but. And, it, and then Tyra called it like smizing. And then I was like, that doesn't make any sense to smile with your eyes. I don't get that. And then I was like, well, confidence 
comes from the eyes. So what what is it? What do the eyes do? And they can only do you know only open and close. So I I ended up trademarking squinch. And I defined it, and it's narrowing the distance between your pupil and your lower eyelid. So it's your lower eyelid moving up. And when you look at somebody that's doing that, there's more confidence coming out from them. So I'm now working with some. Um, I'm working with an ex uh, Secret Service agent who was doing polygraph testing, and I photographed her for her headshots, and. She was just amazed at what I could read on people's faces that they got trained to do in the Secret Service that I, you know, do instinctually through seeing what the human face is doing. So this is the kind of stuff that, you know, gears me up. I love that. And that's the attention to detail that a lot of photographers don't even, they did, that just passes them by because it becomes, it's a different job, or at least other photographers think it's a different job. For me, it's my job, you know, my job. And for people who are here this first time, describe the squinch again. The squinch is a maneuver that we do when we're when we appear confident and we do it naturally. Our subconscious actually generates it for us. But in front of cameras, you have to concoct it a little bit sometimes. And it's narrowing the distance between your lower eyelid and your pupil. So you're bringing your lower eyelid up towards your pupil, but your top eyelid's not going down. So it's not squinting. It's squint. I called it squinching. And there is a video out there that you can look at that I did. They had me on Good Morning America with it and everything. It was really fun. And I use it every day. Um, I think confidence is just a huge part of life and being successful. And I think we all gain confidence through, um, you know, I gained it through trial and error. I taught myself photography and I gained the confidence through doing. I did it when I was training for the Olympics. When I first started sailing and I first started going for it, I, I didn't know that I had it in me to do it. And through, I, I remember going to, uh, I love this story, uh, different, if you look at whatever you're doing and everybody has gone through this, whatever it is that you do or whatever you're doing, you, you know, you look at your strong points and your weak points. And when you're training for the Olympics, you really, if you have weak points, you're in trouble. So my weak points, I started to look at, and I knew that the biggest, um, gains can be made downwind in this boat I sail called the laser. So downwind sailing, you get around the first mark, you go downwind and the fastest guys would crush you on that point of sail. So I was really slow. I was terrible at it. And I, so I decided to move from, I was living in, um, I was living in New Jersey and the fastest guy in the United States was living in California and training at the U S sailing center in long beach, California. So I decided to pack up my boat, throw, I threw it in a van, I drove across country um, and um, started training with that guy. And I got my butt kicked for, for probably the first three months of work, working with him, him and another guy, they both killed me down when, anyway, long story short, I caught up to them and then I, I got fat, I got as fast as them and then I got a little faster. So I was one of the fastest in the world downwind and I think that goes to show, and I know you've done this on winning, that, that if people do that and you start to nip in the butt the, the little, you know, where you feel you're the weakest, eventually that'll become your strong suit. And then the other stuff that you're already good at, it's just like you're over the top and you're going. And um, there's another quote that I always kind of live by because I always felt like I was, I was beating myself. Like I would be like, I never felt like the guy – like, yeah, the world champion was amazing. And he's, you know, how am I going to ever beat that guy? I, the, you know, I always, there's a big head game when you get to that level too. Right. Um, but I think there's a, the, Bill Gove said, um, amateurs compete, professionals create. And I was like, I don't want to compete with anybody but myself. I'm going to create. And that was the, the thing that I brought into my photography and I brought it into my sailing. And that was the the probably one of the main things that made me excel to where I was able to do the things that I did in a boat and do the things I did with a camera. Well, if I made the statement to you uh, that you know, I've always felt like there's no real confidence that comes without achievement. 
In other words, there's no way you can really be confident unless you prove to yourself you could do something. And the only way to that, do that is to get out there and, you know, prove to yourself you could do it. Absolutely. I think confidence is learned. I mean, I'm, I'm proof of that. I mean, I definitely experienced that all my life. And when you probably, now when you're out there training with the best uh, in that downwind uh, uh, phase, I've always felt like uh, your eyes, you know, if you want to make the fastest progress, I've always said, find the best, whatever it is you want to be good at, find the best in that arena that you possibly can and get as close to them as you possibly can and lock in on what you see, you know, because greatness is caught and not taught. And a lot of these things you need to like see it with your own eyes and like realize it so you can internalize it. But your attention to detail had to pay off for you when you were going through that experience. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it amazes me. And to go back and think about it now, I was wondering, I was curious while you were saying that, I was wondering, because I don't remember how much I actually watched what he did or just was with him and trying to figure out on my own, how much did I actually apply from his body movements or the way he trimmed the sail or steered the boat? I was wondering if it was just being with him and getting beat so many times that I had to try so many different things till I figured it out or if I was watching him. And I think it was a combination of, of both. Um, so interesting. Yeah, it's a I think it's a combination of both. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's learning, observing, doing, hearing. Uh, it just takes a while for that to get into, cause it's got to like get into your, brain into your your tissue you know these things you know some of it's yeah. in your tissue so it's muscles that you've got to learn different ways of moving but you know the brain's got to govern it all so it's it takes a but if you're around it uh and that and by the way peter that's why i do these podcasts because when you come to greatness you know, you could, people can actually teach you fundamentals, but they can't teach you greatness. You know, greatness is, is doing things uh, with fundamentals. And you got to go to, if you're going to go to greatness, you got to go by yourself. And uh, oh, I love you gotta, that. You got to create, you know, and uh, what inspires you or what, you know, the great thing about the great role models is they give you a direction. They give you a picture that, you know, you're never going to be exactly like them, but you can pick up. Uh, a picture of the missing pieces. Because the thing is, the, again, the reason for this podcast and uh, other, other things that I do on a weekly basis is the fact that I never know what somebody's missing. Usually they don't know what they're missing. And the only thing I can do is get them around, keep them close to me and it give them enough exposures. And we just go through things from different points of view where sooner or later the light bulb will go on to them about what they're missing you know what i'm saying and uh piece by piece they could put it together but they're not going to learn you know you were never going to overcome that weakness if you hadn't gotten around somebody who had mastered that skill and uh uh you know in the, in the sailing and so these things, uh, you have to put yourself in a position if you want to improve your weak areas. And so uh, this, all of this is really uh, fascinating. And you're, it, like you say, you're still improving. You're still in the game and still pushing yourself in the sailing side. Uh, from, and, and what's that like for you right now? How much of an obsession uh, is it? Sounds like it's a lot oh. of fun. I love, yeah, I love it. It's my outlet. I, I think, you know what the funny thing is, is that that weakness became my biggest strength. So it was, it was not only taking a weakness and getting rid of it and, and it wasn't even getting it to, you know, to be average at downwind speed. I became one of the fastest in the, in the world. And, and that was, and I, and I loved it. It became an obsession and I was just so into that. I couldn't wait till I got to the weather mark to go downwind <laughs> And uh, that was amazing. Can you describe, 
I mean, do you specifically know in your mind what it is you picked up during that three months that took you from being uh, that being a weakness to a strength? Do you, is there a way of describing that or is it you have to just grow into it? I think you kind of hit the nail on the head that there's so many variables that, you know, obviously you've got to do it and you've got to, you know, get to, I guess I got to the point where I got out there and I was doing, I'm in the middle of the ocean and these guys are going faster than me. And I'm like, okay, well, they're in the same boat. We weigh a, close to the same amount. Like there can't be that much going on that I'm, I must be doing things terribly wrong. And then just trying to pick them off one at a time. And what it was, it was the, a lot of times um, when I'm, you know, lately I've been trying to, you know, I take big breaks with this sailing stuff. This we're talking about, yeah. I was training with him in 1994. Like yeah. that was like, you know, that was for my first Olympic campaign for the 96 Olympics. And that one, I didn't make the team. I sailed a really bad race in the last race and didn't make the team. But, and then I took a, another break for four years or three and a half years, I guess three years. Well, I got back in a year before the, the Sydney Olympics. And then I stopped, picked up a camera. And when I turned 45, I looked at my life and I was very successful at photography. And um, however, I was out of shape and I had a pinched nerve in my neck. I couldn't really sail very well. I was like a, I was a mess. Um, and I was like, I got to get in shape. So I weighed like 230 pounds on, on New Year's Day, I remember. And the world championship for my age group, which was, I had just turned 45. So it was 45 to 55. It's the same age group I'm in now, um, was in July in Canada, in Kingston, Ontario, in uh, around July 10th. So I was like, I'm 230. For the boat, when I trained for the Olympics, I had to weigh 185. So I was like, okay, I'm going to weigh 185 on July 10th. And from January 1st to July 10th, I went on this major weight loss and working out. I had a trainer and I made it on, and I was 185. I went and sailed the regatta and I finished second. So I was wow. second in the world. Yeah. Wow. And that was it. And then I'm, since then I've been second again. I was second another time. I've been... I think I've been fourth, fifth, and sixth. I've been, you know, I hurt, I, I sprained my wrist like a, I was not very smart. And I arm wrestled a friend of mine and he was much bigger than me. And I tried too hard and I, and I, he sprained my wrist. So I had to sail world championship with a sprained wrist last time, but this time I'm ready. I'm geared up. I'm, I've been winning regattas and I'm practicing. And I think it's the time in the boat and the timing of the waves and the, the back to the original thing. It's a, it's a whole, um, it's it's getting it it's not just mental it's what your body does with the with the wind there's such a combination of things that uh th that you have to do to get the boat to be in sync with the waves the wave pattern and in order to go downwind fast in a laser so um and it kind of became my thing like one of my favorite things to do so you know and and well, we called suit winning Winning at the highest level, you're making, you know, you're usually you're moving fast. You're making a lot of decisions in a short period of time. And it's got to be, you know, you've got to, you can't be posing. That's why these guys, you know, I'm, I'm all the time busting the nuts of the uh, life coaches and the people who, professors and the interviewers who've never done anything other than sip coffee and have interviews with winners, you know, and, yeah. uh, and they think they know it. But the thing is, you got to grow into these things. You learn things uh, and people can tell if you know what you're talking about. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whiteallonwinning.com. Thanks for listening.